Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this tutorial about automated parking with ML Agents. I'm Thomas and today I'm going to explain you how you can do this you see on, on your screen. This project was made as a part of my bachelor's thesis. I study multimedia and creative technologies at Hoest. This is in Kortrijk, Belgium. And there I specialize in AI. Unfortunately, my audio messed up a bit, so I've got to do this part with a voiceover. So I hope it's clear what I'm trying to show here. The whole project can also be found on GitHub. It has some instructions in Markdown, but we'll go over that as well in this video. So we've got an agent, which is driven by a neural network, and it maneuvers into the parking spot. It can account for traffic coming by, and it can also detect a parking spot automatically. So first off, I'll go over some requirements. So you need to be comfortable with Git, so know how to do Git clone. If you really don't know how to do it, you can just go here, download zip, and you'll have the project as well. Second of all, you need Conda. It's easy to make virtual environments and manage packages. We'll need that. Uh, then you'll need Unity installed. Uh, I highly suggest you go to the Unity website and get Unity Hub. That's also an easy way to manage your Unity packages installs. So go get that in the meanwhile. So first of all, if you have Unity Hub installed, you can edit your project right here and browse your folders. Go into the parking environment. It w won't work if you're here. So go in here in parking environment. And this is your actual Unity project. So select this folder. I already did because I created it. It should come here, but you could get an error. Something that looks like this. Missing editor version. That's good. It will give you this error and you can easily install the right version of Unity where it's made in. It's possible that it works in other versions as well, but this version right here is where I, what I created it in or the one that's online on GitHub and is tested and should work on your computer. All right, once it's open, you should see something like this. Could be that these environments are enabled. Depends on how I uh, put the scene on GitHub. It's a bit like a predefined playground. So I made everything very easy to do. You have this environment. You have a lot of environments you can enable. We'll go into that later. Everything is done in prefabs. So everything is really predefined. It's really easy for you to adjust things, edit things across the whole project uh, without a headache and for all these environments in parallel. Uh, if this opens, that's really good. It's time to check if it installed uh, the ML agents package. Normally it looks at the manifest JSON file. So that's in the packages folder of your project right here. And in here it says, uh, if I can find it right here, install ML agents 2.0.1. Uh, you can check if this is true, because to be honest, I don't really know if it actually does that. So you go to window and go to package manager. Now you give it some time to load. All right, so you've got this button right here, and this is where you will select in project first. If you see ML agents 2.0.1, you're good. You don't have to do anything, you're fine. If it's not here, you'll have to go to the Unity registry. Scroll down until you find ML agents. You'll have to s press this button, see other versions. 2.0.1 won't be the one that's here. It will be 1.0.8 at time of recording this. So you have to do other versions, select 2.0.1, give it some time. The install button will be grayed out, but after a while you can click install and just let Unity do its thing. It will install everything and you don't need to worry about it. It should be fine. All right, so Unity is all set up and well. Uh, next up is Python. The Python part isn't that hard. So open a terminal. I really suggest Windows Terminal if you're on Windows. I like it because it has support for uh, tabs that you can rename them. It's quite nice. First of all, you want to go and create a new virtual environment. Sometimes your Python installation can get completely broken because you try to install something and it's incompatible if it has another version and some packages conflict. So it's good to have a virtual environment that's just another installation of Python where you isolate all the packages with a Python install you need for this project. So this is, this is what we're going to do. You can do this on your main Python install, but I won't recommend it. Uh, I'm going to create a new virtual environment with Conda. Create, done, dash n. This is for new. Then you name your environment. So I've already got an environment ML agents for this. 
but I'll call it ML agents too if it lets me use uh, numbers, but I think so. And you're gonna choose for Python 3.8. It's perfectly possible, it's compatible with other versions. I tested it on 3.8, I know it works, so I recommend you do as well. All right, after some time, it's gonna ask you if you wanna do this. So you press Y and enter. It's gonna do its thing, install everything, Python and everything it needs. All right, so your Python install is complete, shouldn't take too long. Now it's time to actually go into this environment because now, like you see here, it's in the environment base. This means it's just in your normal Python install. So if you wanna go into this environment, you do conda activate and then the name of your environment. It says it's right here also. So in my case, it's ML agents too. All right, we're in our environment. If we type Python now, we'll be greeted with a Python instance and it's 3.8. So that's great. It works. All right. Next up, we're going to install the ML agents package. This is really easy. Just do pip install ML agents. If that's finished, you'll it, it's possible you'll get an error, but that's not really a big deal for us. Uh, something to do with Jupyter notebooks, but we don't really need that right now. Uh, next up is PyTorch. If you ever installed TensorFlow, well, PyTorch actually makes it quite easy. If you go to their website, you can scroll down and there will be a section install PyTorch. Right here, you can choose long-term stable preview or stable. I'll just take stable. Which package manager you want to do it through? I have Conda, so I, I'll leave it here. The language, Python, and then the CUDA version. You'll have to check this if it's compatible with your graphics card. But if you're not sure and you think your graphics card is quite old, just take the lowest one. I have a 1050 Ti in here. I use CUDA 10.2. It works completely fine. So copy this and just paste it right here. Enter. It's going to ask you again because you use Conda if you want to install all of this. Yes, we want to install this. So we press Y and enter. All right. So after a long wait, I hope you got some coffee in the meantime. Uh, it's finished. It's checking if it all works. You can do this by just using the ML agents dash learn command. And if everything worked right, we should see the Unity logo pop up in just a moment. Here we go. It does look a little bit different than I tried it last time, so it's possible that it got an update or something. Yeah, it's totally different. They updated it. Nice. Yeah, you can see it right here, but that shouldn't be a problem at all. all right, now that we have everything installed, we want to know how to train. How do you actually train an agent? Before we're going to do that, I'm going to go over the environment, what everything does, a little bit of the code, and then I'll show you how to train it. So if you go to the car agent, which is also found in the prefabs right here, you can see a lot of these scripts. If you're familiar with Unity, which I hope you are a little bit, at least, you know that it works with game objects. And if you want to apply physics to it, you have you've got to have a rigid body and if you want it to collide with other things colliders and all that stuff so that's that's not really important right now first off you have the car controller script this script is from the unity standard assets so it comes with unity you can get it from unity themselves and they make it really easy to take these prefabs from cars which i got from the asset store some free assets they are also low poly which is good for performance especially in machine learning you can change these around if you like they'll work with the script uh, if they have wheel colliders if they have a body just like this it will work with the script so it's from unity but I adjusted it. I wasn't really too happy with all the controls, how everything was working and how to make it work with the outputs of the model. So I did some adjustments, I did some tweaking and I got it as close as possible to where I find a real car behaves. It works, it works great. The engine brake, the braking itself, the controls, it's just a lot better for this kind of usage. It's also found here. So these are all the scripts from the standard assets and car controller right here has uh, some modifications. Next up, you have the car agent. So the car agent actually is the probably the most important part of the script. It contains all the logic for the agents. This is normally on 7, 750. This is what I've trained the two models on, but you can change this all around. So the max steps is how many steps it can do, how many instructions can it give to steer, accelerate, brake before an episode ends. Uh, it got 
it has a couple of parameters. Uh, spawn radius. So every time an episode starts, it spawns in the place where you put it. Right here, right here, right here. It takes a radius and spawns it in a random radius. You can define this for the X. So this is the X axis and Z axis. So that makes it also really flexible. You've got an environment radius. So if it exceeds this radius, it will reset. The in target multiplier isn't uh, implemented right now, but could be if you want. This is this has to do with reward shaping. Now you've got a target. So when training, the agent needs to know a target, where to go to, where to park. So in our environment, it's called here. It's this prefab. I also call it target. You just drag it on here and it'll know, hey, this target right here, this is where I have to go to. Now you've got some interesting things right here, car cameras. So if you have a really, really beefy system, you could use these. Unfortunately, my system just caught fire. It, it just couldn't handle it. But I have these self-driving cam cameras available for you. So they're placed around the car. They're in all these containers like you can see and I set them up so that they have pretty much coverage of everything important so that you don't really have a lot of dead zones while also not having too many cameras that it's unrealistic because I wanted to go for realism and get it as close to real life as possible with this one so if you drag these on the car agents cameras right here it'll add them and it will use them as input for the model later on. You can also define the resolution you want. Uh, 200 is already a lot. I'd suggest like keeping it at 100, even if you have a very, very hard system. Uh, you can convert them to grayscale, so that's one third of the data. I highly suggest this option to be on if you use them. And the sensor compression. You can have none or you can, can have PNG. So I also made this myself so that it can spawn camera components that are compatible with the ML Agents Toolkit. Use these as inputs and everything is done for you. So that's pretty nice. Now you've got Find Parking Spot. This is an option. I'm going to disable the camera though. When you have a trained agent, you can place it right here, for example. And like you've seen before, if I press play, it'll detect a parking spot. You don't want this to be on during training. That's very important. This has to be off. Then you've got behavior parameters. So this is more how does the model look like. So you give it a name. I just named it car behavior. This this can be anything. What's If it's clear for you, it's good. Then you have the observation. The vector observation means how will I input my data into the model? So you have got to define the space size. For us, the space size is this. But you see, we have lots of sensors. Why is this one? Well, this is because if you set it to one, it'll just look how many observations are there available just take them all now you've got stacked vectors so this is something really cool that they implemented so what it does it takes a sequence of observations why is this good why can't we just use these values well for example the car is here it's standing still and everything around him is standing still as well you know what i'm gonna perform this okay so right here yeah if our agent now chooses to stop, stand still, it will see that all these distances pretty much are the same across these three observations. But right here, a car is approaching. And since it only knows distances and not, hey, this ray is a car, this is nothing, this is a, a wall, for example, it just knows the distances because of the context and it sees that in these three actions, this car is approaching and this is getting smaller even though it isn't doing anything, it can conclude in a very abstract, abstract manner in the neural network, hey, this is a moving object. And it wouldn't be possible if you only had one observation. So these stacked vector size is really good for that. If I continue here, you see, the car is able to actually account for the car that's moving. And once it's gone, it can continue with its parking maneuver. I've got the steps too low, but you see, it's really nice. Also super hard to implement if you do it yourself, like it's a hassle. And right here, just a matter of putting this number to anything you like. You have to find a balance. There isn't really a right value for this. So it's just trial and error, like see what your agent is happy with, if it trains, if it converts. Uh, for my case, I found that using three vectors works fine. So that's why it's on three. 
I wouldn't be able to give you an answer like what is the actual good value for this. Now you've got the actions. This is something you have to define. In our case, the actions we have is steering, acceleration, and braking, if I'm right. If you ever driven a car or you just know a car in general, you don't just steer all the way left or all the way right. It's a continuous action. It's like you're you're one time you'll be a little bit in the middle or something. So it's never black or white. That's why we use continuous actions here. In most cases, you don't always floor the throttle, depending on the case, of course, but for just driving, you don't always floor the throttle. So that's also continuous and same for braking. You don't always slam on your brakes. To implement this is also very hard and ML agents made it very easy to just say, hey, I want three continuous actions and it will generate the network in a way that your output are three outputs between minus one and one. So that's indicative of a 10H activation function. Next up, we have the model. So right here, I've got two train models. If you want to test your model, just choose it. If not, you want to train, set it to none. Done. Uh, next up, you have the decision requester. Right here, this Unity environment is not Python. Our training script is Python. We need a way to communicate with these two and this uses gRPC messages, if I write, like uh, protobuf uh, messages uh, to communicate between these two. And with this one, you can choose how many steps do I take before I take a decision or request a decision from the script. Set this to one if you just always want decisions from the script. And then you've got the ray perception sensor. So these are our parking sensors. Uh, pretty straightforward. Just some sensors around the car, not too many to make it realistic, but also enough for enough coverage. And then at last, the demonstration recorder. So in our training, we use PPO, which is a reinforcement learning algorithm. But for rewarding, we also use a method called imitation learning. In specific, we use behavior cloning and generative adversarial imitation learning. To explain it very easy, it comes down to it. You give it some examples from you, the expert, like they call, and you record them, the state action pairs. If you enable this, and you don't have a model right here, and you start recording, it will record your state actions to a file, which you can later use in training. And it's actually really handy for exploration. So, for example, if it's in this state, it can take like a million steps for it to realize, hey, if I want to get closer, I need to drive forward. If you have examples which say, if it's here, go forward, it really quickly learns that it has to go forward to get closer to this target. Uh, it saves you a ton of time. It's a really nice feature. If you want to record them themselves, just make sure everything is disabled. This is on, no model is available. Then number of steps to record, just leave it at zero if you want to record all of them. Give it a name. So for me, I'll, it will spawn randomly, 90 degrees, it has traffic, so something like that. It has a maximum character count, so I think it cuts this off, but maybe by doing this. And then you take a directory. So if you go to the file structure of the project, you'll see uh, right here, the folder demos. If you click this, I have a ton of them, like some tests. And you can define these in the training config. So this is the training config, and right here you see... I've got the demo file. We'll get into that later. So that's everything for the agent. So that's what the agent does. So if I take a look at the script, you can see. So first it uh, looks, do I have to look for a parking spot? If not, it does this. And this is the request decision. So this goes to the decision requester and asks for a decision from Python. This here is some logic. If it gets out of the environment, this counts the reward and the episode. And pretty much this is all the logic for resetting initializing everything. We've got some helper functions right here. I just put them in the same script because I thought it was the easiest way. Then we got a calculate reward. So it looks, is it, is it going towards the target? How far is it from the target? Depending on that, it gives rewards. Same for if it's in the targets, it calculates the angle in which it parks. If the angle is really small, it gets more rewards. So you can just Take a look at this at your own pace. I won't really go into depth right here. Uh, the add cameras, all automated. Right here, we pass also the speed of the car as an input. I found that it helped a little bit. And then we got our uh, input logic. So like I said before, the inputs are between minus one and one. I checked it, this by using the Python script, uh, the Python notebooks, which you can take a look at as well. They're really nice for debugging 
your uh, inputs to the network because you can take the state actions and just look at them as an array. So right here, I just calculated to be the right format for the core controller to move the core. Earlier I said break, but it's reverse. And if it's going forward and, and the logic from the car sees the model wants to reverse, it actually breaks until it's going to reverse. In a way, it's the same, but it's not really. Um, then right here, the inputs. I For everything, I commented which is the range of the inputs and I um, calculated them. The heuristic one might be strange at first. So what it actually does is it has sort of a buffer with the continuous output. So it's an array where it looks at. And if I take the heuristic, so if it gets heuristics, it fills it up right here. So it uses the steering to fill this up, Excel to put this up and reverse for this. Then it goes to here. It received an action. It doesn't matter if it's inference or a heuristic. It just received an action. It looks, hey, what are these actions? And even if it comes from here, it can access them here, revert them back to the right values and use them. So that's a pretty nice system, actually. So right here, we got some collision logic. Uh, it just checks for if it's in the target, if it hits a wall, curb or car. In this case, we don't have curbs, but I started with parallel parking. Unfortunately, I didn't get to get it working because it exploited the front bumper of the person behind it. If you want to adjust this, know that hours and hours of time went into the rewards. Rewards are actually the most difficult thing in all of this. You might think it's all the logic, it's the algorithms. No, it's quite simply the rewards. Rewards are really hard. If you, the, the agent just optimizes to get the best rewards and it really it's really good and finding exploits in this so if you didn't account your rewards right it can find an exploit and in my case for parallel parking for example it found this exploit that it can use the car behind him to stop faster and get rewards faster so it sac sacrifices on this to get more rewards i'll show you so like you see it sacrifices this one collision to get these rewards faster. Tuning rewards is really, really, really hard. So that's it for the, the, the agent. This is actually the most important part of the project, I think. So how do we train it? So we got an idea of how to train it. Initial position for PPO, initial, uh, yeah, your initial state, PPO is less sensitive to it, but that doesn't mean it needs the right exploration to create a good model. So even if you just want it to park behind like this and you always spawn it here, it doesn't have enough exploration. It doesn't have enough randomness to actually create a good model. So in my findings, it's best to put it right here in the middle, let it spawn in quite a big radius and let it park from everywhere. It will be really good in generalizing and just parking overall. Even if you only want to park from the front in the back, it's a lot better like this. So put your agent right here so if you want to train you have to prepare your environment first so what do you do you go here you set all your parameters so i say right uh, i want my agent like move it a little bit i want it right here set your parameters like you want it make sure the demonstration recorder is off and right here there's no model if everything is good all right great then you can take this duplicate it why this enables parallel training so you can use a lot of experiences from agents at the same time to fill up your buffer and train from. It speeds up training a lot. This is really dependent on your system specs, but it's also bottlenecked by the protocol it uses to communicate with Python. You need to find a sort of a balance with this. This works for me. It's quite expensive. Maybe a little less would work better. So yeah, that's, that's really dependent on your system specs. Like 20, 30 agents works great. Once that's good, you can check it for another environment. Is this also good? Yeah, okay, then all the environments are good. Now, right now you have two options to train. First off, make sure you're in your environment and in your project path. What you want to do now is use the command ML agents learn again, but don't press enter because right now we need to define our settings and our settings are right here, the training set settings of the YAML. So I created this for you, this works. But you'll need a demo file. We don't have this demo file. What are we going to do? Well, create one. I'll try to make sure there's one online, but if not, you can create one by doing this. 
Make sure it's on. Uh, make sure that it's not for the other ones. Yeah, okay. So put demonstration recorder on, give it a name. So I'll do 90 degree test just for now. And right now you can drive the car and just park it. Simple as that. It's not easy at all. Like it's quite hard. Like you, you'll find that, whoa, the agent will become a lot better than you. Like this is actually pretty hard. So give it a couple of examples how to park. So yeah, you want you want around 20 episodes of so or so like 20 episodes of parking. And if you go to your demos right here, you'll see the demo file. See my demo files are a bit larger. So if you want to use that demo file, you just go here and name it to this one. It's in the demos folder and it's that one. But I'll, I'll take this one now. Right here, I've got some hyperparameters. I suggest you re read the paper about proximate policy optimization or just watch some instructional videos to understand it better. But I'll go over it really quickly. So these are hyperparameters from PPO specific. Now you got the network it's trying to learn. So this is your policy. So it's 264 nodes, uh, neurons, sorry, with three layers. So not that big. Then you got your rewarding. So this is just the rewarding from the environment. You can give it a discount factor. So this is how much it discounts into the future. And this is the strength. So it's at 99. It could be one. Um, yeah. Why is it no one? Like could be one perfectly. Well, I'll, I'll let it stay on 99. Now you've got get this Gale. So this is actually one of the favorite things I discovered during this project. So Gale is a generative adversarial imitation learning. Quite a hard name. Um, to explain it simply, you, you all heard of the deep fakes. So deep fakes are a very, very popular thing right now. Like they're they're used for, for even in movies, I think. So deep fakes are based on GANs. So GANs are generative adversarial networks. See where the comparison is right here. So essentially, what a GAN does is you give it a lot of real images and you generate a lot of fake images. And you have a discriminator which tries to learn, hey, this is a fake image, this is a real image. If it sees, oh, the discriminator was really good at picking out my fake image, the network will adjust itself and try to make a more real image. Meanwhile, the discriminator will try also to become better. So we have these two networks fighting each other to become better and better, and you will converge to something that's almost indistinguishable from the real thing. But you can apply this to everything. You don't have to apply this to images and video alone. So right here, it's actually used to generate states and actions. So you give it the real state action pairs, the one from the demo file, and you generate actions using the policy. And the closer it gets to the actual expert, so our demo file, the better it will be parking. But you don't want this to be the only thing because we want better performance than us. You have seen me parking like I'm not really good at it. A sort of factor of how much the reward is getting weighed. So it only takes one third of the reward to do back propagation on the actual policy. So for me, I took 0.3, which is actually already a quite a large amount. But if you compare it to the actual rewards it gets, so 0.99, the actual rewards from the environment are way more important than this. So what's the result? Again, like I said before, the agents have a lot less exploration. They already know a way how to park in a sense, but not really how to do it good. So that saves you a ton of time. And it's 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 a beautiful system in my opinion, like it's amazing. So this is kind of the same, but it just does supervised learning. So it takes a demo file, it looks at the state action pairs, and it just does supervised learning using the policy network and it looks like how close does this get it's not really that great this works a lot better this is only for 750,000 steps which is not a lot this goes into the millions 10 millions even uh, so we give it a hard strength in the beginning but after that it does nothing so that's also to limit the exploration time and just help it in exploration to go in the right direction so more a time saving thing and not a performance thing. Uh, right here, we've got the checkpoints. So if you have a training run, you can find it back right here in results. I'll take the last one and the best one. So you have your model, but right here, it also takes checkpoints. So you can have older models. So these are 15 older models in an interval of 1 million time steps. So we have one at 50 million. Uh, we have one at 50 million as well, but 
because 50 million was the, the absolute max it did it twice i think right here a million less a million less a million less so every million the last 50 million steps it keeps a model every million you can choose it right here so that's nice if you're suffering from catastrophic forgetting for example you still have like millions of time steps back of models now you have the time horizon so this is also a very important parameter if you have your agent and it has 750 steps you can choose how much of these steps it puts into the buffer to train this is a good value make this too large it doesn't it doesn't train it can't generalize well enough 264 for this we're great so that was hyperparameter tuning uh be very careful with this this can break everything uh and then we have threaded so the way ppo works is it fills up the buffer size with simulated state action pairs and if this buffer buffer size is full it will train the policy network. If it trains the policy network and this is on false, it will first train it and then go further. But that's just wasted time because you can collect new steps while it's training. And when the training is done, it, all, it, it might have filled up the next buffer and it can train again immediately. So threaded saves you a lot of time. Uh, I'd keep this on. One thing I went over is this here, normalize. The rates are already normalized, but it's good if you use, for example, in my case, as one input, the car speed in kilometers an hour is not normalized. So if you don't want to mess around with all the code, this does it for you. It normalizes it. Works great. Uh, to my understanding, it used something like variance of the values and to create a normalized function. Neural networks can work way better with normalized values than normal values. So. That's a great setting as well, very easy. So we went over the training file, so now we want to use it. So where's the training file or what's its name? It's, uh, uh, right here, trainer settings.yaml. So we're on the, we're in the project, so we just have to do the relative path. To this, that, so that's just training settings.yaml. Next up, you want to give it a run ID. So this is to just give it the name and identify it. So I'll do tutorial run. This has to be unique for every run you do. After that, you can do an optimization, which is called quality level. So you say quality level zero. This uh, frees up resources, so it doesn't render in full quality, which we also don't need full quality. So if you press enter here, I made a mistake. Oh, yeah, training settings. You'll see listening on port 5004. So it asks, asks you to play in the Unity Editor. editor. So I'll make sure this is off. Enable the other environments to train in parallel and press play. So it'll freeze for a second and you'll see it connects. It outputs the training config with some default values which are not defined filled in. So this is also a good reference to see what's available. And like you see, it starts doing things. So it's actually training. It's really laggy because it's quite intensive. Also, the time scale is higher. So it doesn't simulate at real time speed, it simulates at like 20 times the speed. And it does this like, in this case, like 30 times in parallel. So the frame rate is really bad. If you open a new tab, I renamed it with this here, called TensorBoard. Activate your environments, like usual, go to the project. You can do TensorBoard, then the flag log directory, and then results. If you get an error, check if your virtual environment is enabled. For me, it's the original ML agent environment, uh, but yeah, it's the same installation, so it will work as well. Uh, for you, yeah, it's it, this is just gonna be your name for your environment, and it gives you a local host. And right here, you have TensorBoard. You'll have to give it some time to spin up, especially for mine. Like I have one or two gigabytes uh, in runs. Like I did a lot of them. But after some time, you'll start to see all your results listed right here. All right, so they popped up. Like you see, I have a lot of them. So if I select tutorial run right now, I don't think we'll see anything because the results haven't come in yet. If I check here, okay, it has one, one step. So you see, it gives the mean reward this and that. So while it's loading all the statistical data itself, like it can take some time, especially if you have all these runs. If you go to text, it's quite nice. You can actually see which config you use. So it saves the config. So if you have different runs you want to compare and you want to see, hey, what went wrong? Did I change something? 
you can compare them right here. Like if I select this one, you see, I can compare them right here. I use a bigger network than here and you can compare the results. So that's really nice. In the meanwhile, if we go back, you can see like the agent apparently has already learned to drive backwards. So this is mostly due to the behavior cloning and the uh, the gale. And you can see right here, the reward is already going up. The deviation of the reward is getting less. So that's only like 200,000 steps, but you want to run it for like 50 million or something. So it takes a very long time for me, like seven hours or something before you actually get like usable results. In case of this, I would have to run this like two days. So this would take like a very long time. Like it's 200,000 steps and it's been busy for 400. There's actually a way to speed this up even more. How do you do that? You go back to Unity right here, you check everything is right, and you make an actual build of your application. You can do this bit file, build settings, and you get this. So it might be that you have to add the scene to the build, just add open scenes, make sure this is checked, and go to player settings, and also verify that run in background and uh, visible in background, and all of those background things are enabled. Okay, so you're good, you can build. I won't build it because I have a good build already. Give it some time and it will open the build folder for you automatically. So right here, you can see created the XC. We can now use this build to actually train. What's the nice, the nice thing about the build? You can run different instances in parallel and you can disable graphics rendering completely. So how do you do this? I'll go back. We'll keep the training settings. So because we want them, the run ID. I'll call it build. And then you can define the number of environments you want to use with this flag, uh, number of environments. If you want to say, okay, I want the training of this environment and I want to do this five times, I do this five times in a row. But you have to be careful with your summary frequency because you're going to have five times the amount of steps. So you have to calculate actually the number of environments. So say it's 20 times the amount of steps, 750. So this is your, so this is the minimum checkpoint interval you want to have per environment instance. If I have five, I have to do this times five. Else your data is going to fluctuate because it's between episodes finishing and stuff. For five, a hundred K should work. We have some reserve. And it would average it to the right amount of rewards. Next up, you want to define which environment. So in our case, this is kind of stupid in my honest opinion. Not, you don't have to define the actual build right here, the exe, but the folder it's in. Don't ask me why, they chose to do it like this. You take builds and it will look, hey, is, there a, is it an ML agent's Unity build? exe okay i will use this finally no graphics this is only if you don't use the camera so right here you say don't render anything just use the unity physics and that's good if you have cameras you can't use this but in our case we don't use cameras so we can use this and it's not going to ask you to press play in unity so it's just going to spin up all these environments if you look in task manager you can see Windows Terminal. So we have all these environments, five, like we said. For each environment, we got a Python instance and then one big instance, which does the training because it uses a lot of GPU sometimes. And that's it. It started training right now. So this goes way faster. It's uh, quite nice. So I'll check if TensorBoard has loaded. So this is a training run I did last night. So like you see, I let it go for 50 million. It even has some room for improvements, but I don't have that time. So if I would let it go further, it would be really good. But unfortunately, we live in a world with deadlines. And it trained for 14 hours. So that's not too bad, actually. Like it parks really well. It's the, the model you saw in the demo. 15 hours to... To teach it right here you can also see some uh, other statistics like the rewarded got from extrinsic rewards so this is from the environment and what it got from the gale um you can see the episode length all those things losses like it's great this is the graph you want to see the fastest i've got it on my system is about 1000 steps a second um so this is how you train so I'll, I'll stop it right here because i'm not going to wait 14 hours for you guys and i don't think you will want to either if your run is finished like you saw before you go to our run right here it will have generated an on o n n x file and you can just use it so drag it to your assets like i got a folder here models i renamed it i called it 90 degrees because it's a 90 degree turn 
uh, tree stack because it uses three observations for the input of the model and version two because it's a larger model. Uh, you also got the whole model here, how it uh, the layers are constructed, the inputs, the outputs. So it's quite nice, this format. I think it's uh, made by Facebook, but don't quote me on that. And you can just drag it on your agent right here. And if I take my environment, so I'll disable the alert, take the environment, make sure the model is right here. Uh, go to my agent in the scene view, put it somewhere around here and enable find parking spot. It's going to find a spot for us. And once it's detected one, so then it's going to position itself because the model doesn't like to be in the dead center. Then the model is going to take over and do the parking maneuver. You'll see it here in the console pop up. Found parking spot. It's going to position itself and then the model takes over. So like you see, it just parks without a problem. It's a little bit crooked, but hey, it parks. Obviously it doesn't like to start from here. Maybe if you position it to right here, it's going to perform better. Um, but yeah, hey, we've got our agent, we trained it, we deployed it and it works. So yeah, that's great. So I hope you got a better insight on how this all works, like the how amazing ML Agent is to work with. There is another scene, but it won't be ready at the time of recording this. Uh, for parallel parking, I would have to adjust the agent a bit to work with both of them. The parking spot detection won't work as well, but feel free to try and do it yourself. It's uh, quite easy. Just take an environment, put it in there, adjust the rewards, trade it, and yeah, that's about it.